welcome back, viewers and esteemed members of our company's board of directors to episode four of the Corota Motors Let's Play. We started in 1946 with nothing but an empty factory and dreams of selling small, cheap cars. So far, we've sold some small, kind of expensive cars, but things are going... Well, they were going well for us earlier, and now they're not. We'll get onto that in a little more detail, though. Right now, we're just getting ready to phase out our very first car that launched the company, the Coniglio. It's currently on sale at the same time as our Coniglio successor car. We just call it the Coniglio 2. And now that it's 1963, the uh, original Coniglio is very nearly 20 years old. It's time to stop building it. In its place, we'll be building a new car. And the Coniglio 2 is going to get some new trims as well. And why is it that we are losing money? Well, I've taken a little look here. First of all, we have a huge loan repayment. For the Coniglio 2 in the last episode, I sprung for steel presses. Those let our car be built in a monocoque chassis and out of steel, which in theory should both make it better and cheaper. And it hasn't necessarily panned out. It's not that much better as I thought it would be, and it's not cheaper either because the tools are so dang expensive. We also have another issue. If I scroll down, uh, it looks like Engine Factory 1 here is not hiring enough staff and also uh, completely overworked. I'm not sure what's up with our staff being so low. I, I know we made an expansion, but I thought I had the settings so we wouldn't be taking uh, forever to hire staff. Uh, but we are. So probably what I'm going to do is add a second engine factory as soon as possible. Because I think that's reducing our production of the Coniglio 2, maybe. And uh, not helping our profits. The other thing we're going to do is introduce a new model. We'll be looking at that soon. But uh, first, I want to take a moment to look at the comments from our board of directors. Flame and Cyborg Guy suggests that the next car should be named the Caprice. I see, it's like the Chevy Caprice, only it's a salad. Yeah, we can probably work with that. We've got a couple people saying that we should consider the van as a variant for our Coniglio. And I think we'll probably go ahead and do that. It'll get us into the delivery market, which is untouched by us so far, but should be good money. Stale Mahoney says we should really be running more factory shifts, which I think is right, considering that we're in pre-orders right now and only running two shifts, although we're actually bottlenecked by the engine factory, which I didn't realize last time I was playing the game. And we also have, surprising to me, multiple requests to put some interiors on these cars. And you know what? I just don't like building interiors. I'm not good at it, and I'm not sure why you'd want to watch me fumble through it and end up with a crappy looking interior. But I have to do what my board of directors says. I have already gone ahead and built an interior for the Coniglio 2. The uh, Coniglio 1 won't be getting one, so it's supposed to end production during this episode. And I've got a little recording I can watch back here. The first thing you'll see me putting onto this is the new Corota badge. That's a mod that I made just for this campaign, and I probably won't be publishing it, because I'm not proud of it. First off, I got the scale wrong, so it's gigantic. And second, it's all polygonal, and it looks like something that Banjo-Kazooie would collect. I, uh, in my head, I sort of thought that I would save some time by not having to build the old Crota badge out of, like, multiple badges and bumper bars. But uh, clearly, that is, is wrong. It took me way more time to do that. Uh, surprising no one, I'm sure. So, making the interior for the Coniglio. I started off with a dash that has body paint on it. I'm kind of inspired by a, a photo of an old Fiat 500. It's got a similar design. You see that in a lot of the, the really old cars where they have metal on the interior. That's pretty much gone after the 70s or so. And this is the premium interior, so it's getting some kind of leathery seats. But there's still an old-fashioned simplistic shape. 
there's a, just a giant list of interior fixture options. It always gets me lost. I don't even know which category I'm trying to look in. So we got the two front seats, they're full size, and the collapsible rear seats. Those, of course, are something that gives us a comfort penalty, and uh, I had to make them look uncomfortable as well. Building a floor is uh, what we call in the business a huge pain in the ass. I don't feel like I should have to have that transmission tunnel there. Uh, I think I tried to shrink it and it wouldn't work, or it clipped through the exhaust so I couldn't really do it. But uh, realistically, the car doesn't need one that's that big, but I still have to try and build around it and cover it up with carpet. Uh, what I ultimately ended up doing was having this center tile, uh, maybe not right now, but I changed it later to look like exposed aluminum, matching kind of the theme of the rest of the car. See me working many steps to get a pedal into place. And those probably aren't even like the right pedal choices, but uh, they're the ones they happen to find at the time. Uh, right for the ear is what I mean. And I'm also working a little bit with the... Uh, you have 2D and 3D fixtures. Some of the 2D fixtures are cool in that you can place them on the outside of the car and they'll conform to the inside. Which 3D fixtures, you never get them to follow curves the way you want. And I've just got those very plain door cards with the leather panels. I was pretty pleased myself that I found this parcel shelf because you can basically never make the trunk look good with the giant wheel wells and stuff that are on these automation bodies. So if I just get to cover up the trunk with that little privacy parcel shelf cover, then uh, I don't have to put a bunch of fixtures in place awkwardly and cover up the wheel well. Of course, we've got hand crank windows. This is a car whose first version launched in 1958, so don't even dream of power windows. And I even got over-enthusiastic and decided to put a roof onto it. I don't normally do that at all for interiors, but I think that the light color definitely helps the look of the car. After all that work on the roof, though, I forgot to put in a center uh, rear-view mirror, which I'm pretty sure cars from back then would tend to have. But uh, we'll just say it's a quirky Corotta feature that you don't get one. And you know, once again, there's never a fixture that quite matches the shape of the body when you want to cover some organic shape up like these curvy pillars. So I'm layering some multiples over each other. If you're trying to learn how to build good interiors, uh, don't learn from my video. I'm just stumbling through it. Let's see, I spent a long time trying to cover up that little bit of exposed space. And uh, last couple tweaks, I copied the fixtures over to the Merde version. And it doesn't get those seats. Those seats, they're too nice for the Merde. That's why it's Merde. They're getting the cheap seats. Honestly, that looks a little crappy even for standard interior in the 50s. Maybe, maybe not. Maybe that is what a standard would look like. You got the, like, the vinyl instead of the leather. And with that work done, we are ready to move on to our actual facelift of the Coniglio. But before I sign that off, I do think I'm going to try and add an engine factory. And we will see what it is I can afford. Factory managers. New engine factories. New engine factory. And we will consider the configure this for the ooh, for the Mark One Lenita, and then I will have to manually, I think, assign it to the Mark Two soon. We will, of course, uh, proudly continue to manufacture our cars in Fruinia. It is an option to start building things in Arcana, where they're cheap, but. Uh, 
I'm, I'm not sure we want to go down that route yet. You can see that labor costs, though, are 35%, which is uh, uh, cruel. Or you go to Ferenia, where they pay twice as much and are more than twice as skilled, apparently, at uh, 55%. I'd like to go for the large plot, so I can just keep on upgrading that factory in the future. It'd be our main factory. But with the financial situation our company is in now, where we're losing money fast, I think I have to limit us to the medium. We're going to end up with a whole mess of different factories we can't keep upgrading. Uh, it's kind of annoying that you can't, like, sell your factory ever to, to pay for a plot of land or to pay for your next factory. So you end up with like these small factories that can only do small factory things. You can't get rid of them. All you can do is like, you can shut them down if you really want to. But that's a real waste of money. And let's see. We can take eight months to get fully staffed. Seven. That's okay. To produce 600 engines. Uh, you can look at a small three factory. And, oh, that's going to cost us how much? A hundred million dollars, huh? Hmm. This? I'm going to have to make a save file before I try this plan. It is, it is time to save the game. I don't want to bankrupt Kuroda just yet. All right, switching so to a small two factory. Getting some good tooling in here. I don't only spend... Uh, 90 million dollars not really saving a lot and uh oof should i take out a loan i'm not sure there's a point it'll be paying off really quickly anyway uh yeah sign off factory i really need to name these factories but i want to maybe name after some of those locations on the map and i'm not sure how to get a good look at the full-size map outside of uh when you're making a new campaign save file. Maybe I'll pull up a picture later and, and name our factories after some locations. Or you can come up with names for our factories. We've got two car factories and two engine factories. Ignore engine factory one. That's like an outside contract. So we've got that. It's going to take a while to construct. Okay. And I'm not going to wait. I'm going to go. It's going to take one month. Ugh. We are losing money because of that factory construction. But our revenue is actually steadily increasing, which is good. I think that's because our other engine factory is starting to hire more staff, which it desperately needs. Yes, yeah, so the, the engine factory is limited by staffing issues because it's still hiring people. And the car factory is limited by the engine factory. So let's work on our new project. The Coniglio 2 series uh first things first the primo b our second version what needs to change about our little car first off the engine uh i don't know if i already made some tweaks to this when i was messing around we can still get away with no harmonic damper because we have a small little engine and that would be like a little counterweight uh near the flywheel that does some... or be no, near the other end of the crank? It's a little counterweighted wheel that cancels out some secondary vibrations. Makes the engine run smoother. Larger engines will need that outright just to be, like, functional. Do I dare actually nerf the quality of the pistons a little bit? I think I might. It could save us some cash per engine. And we're not quite stressing them out to the point where it matters. Actually, yes, I can see. If I take some quality out of the pistons, it does hurt our power output a tiny bit, fuel efficiency. It's not hurting reliability, which is the main thing. So we are going to make the pistons exactly weak enough that they're not quite being ruined by our 52 horsepower. Top end? Uh, yeah, I can get a quality point. Uh, fuel system. Go all the way to plus three, maybe. Plus four? I can try plus four. So, carburetors are pretty cheap to put quality on. It's very worth it to have a good quality carburetor. It'll make more power and save gas. And the reliability effect is a lot, too. And, uh, 
I think we're going to stick with the Eco Carbs for sure. The engine, uh, the main version engine anyway. They, they save gas, and they're just plain cheaper than the other kind of carburetors. For the kind of market we're going for, we probably don't need to change that almost ever. I tighten up the exhaust and headers a little bit. Gain some fuel efficiency without losing too much power. That's good. Get a point of exhaust quality on there. That also helps reliability. It's quieter. Our gearing. They want a fourth speed. Looking like... It's just another mile per gallon. That's probably got to be something. I'm not sure that the customers actually want it that badly, though. I might stay with three speeds for the uh, the 1960s for this car. Tire size, I'm pretty happy with. Brakes. can't believe this thing needs brake airflow. We have a, a little bit of brake fade. That's brake performance uh, lost due to heat. Not much. Uh, under cladding. I think it's time to introduce that. That's pretty high tech for the 60s. Probably. But uh, that'll get us a little, a lot of stats. Sportiness, I think, because the uh, it helps the top speed with aerodynamics. Fuel economy, of course. Reliability, even two. And we will put maybe a point into aero quality. Maybe even two points. Adding to the cost of the car, but it's it's saving fuel economy. And I think fuel economy is big for us. I'm not scoring that great in city, but it is scoring highly as a fun car. That is, say, uh, like a, a sporty hatchback. Surprisingly well. For being like an economy engine. Supposedly, the average of the top three competitors is a little better in terms of drivability. Uh, of course, not sporty. Worse in comfort. Worse in prestige. I think the main issue is that we're too expensive. That's why our normalized desirability is less than 100%. Stick with the uh, AM radio, of course. Premium interior. Go ahead and crank the quality up to plus three. I think we can afford it. The point on steering, just adding lots of quality points here and there for the, the whole car, pretty much. And we will see how that does us. The uh, Merde can get some similar quality points. Even though it's a cheapy standard interior, it can still be plus three quality. And uh, maybe we will skip the semi clad underneath. No tray. I'll still have the plus two quality in arrow. Because part of the cost of that's engineering. And if we engineer it once for both cars, it doesn't cost us too much, you know. There's no point in having a different value for most of these quality sliders on your trims. It does add out like a couple man hours. But I think that the cheaper buyers who want the Merde, they want that fuel economy. And, uh, of course, we're going to add a new trim. I'm going to clone the Merde. We want the cheaper interior for this. And we're going to make ourselves a little delivery van. All right. What fixtures survived the vanification and what did not? Let's see. Oh. The seams are all over the place. That's all over the place. Give me, give me a minute to try and clean this crap up. Oh gosh, I forgot about the interior. Yeah, that's uh, that's uh, uh, a mess. I, I might just have accept that the back of the van is a little bit uh, black and shadowy. 
now let's see. Uh, we also don't have rear seats anymore. All right, I think at least nothing's poking through the outside anymore. There, we have the boringest shade of beige for our van, which I think is probably appropriate. Okay, now the actual tuning. Uh, so light delivery is our target demographic. We're not doing too bad just to start off with. They like the fact that it is a van. Give them some extra van as well. So we're showing some utility brake fade. That is a brake fade that happens when the cargo is full. That actually matters for uh, us. Uh, oh, geez, we have solid disc brakes available. That will solve most of our problems outright. I should go back and put that on the other versions, too. Say so it will get the cladding. So light delivery, do they want... They gotta want the standard. They want it cheap. No premium interior for, for light delivery. Probably want hydraulic power steering. Well, I guess not. It makes the uh, drivability worse, actually, somehow. I guess this is a car that benefits from responsive steering and more than just being sporty. Suspension. If I got tuned to optimum practicality. No, they want it lower. It's easier to put stuff into. Ah, uh, here we go. These buttons down here, they change the settings for these bars. So I can say the suspension test is with the cargo full. And you can see that suddenly the rear springs are too soft. So at the risk of making the car less comfortable when it's not full of cargo, I can add some rear springs. And I'm not even sure that they actually seem to like that, but I think it also might get some more sales in the medium delivery market. Maybe. I'm also taking the camber out. Don't need this car to be sporty. It can understeer as long as it's soft and easy to drive. Honestly, yeah, it seems like light delivery wants the comfort more than they want the extra cargo weight. So modest springs it is, I guess. What else can I get up? Our fuel economy is better than the average light delivery vehicle. Our utility is not. Which might mean that I need shorter gearing. Which will hurt my fuel economy, but it is what it is. It's a delivery van. You need that lower gearing to get moving with a lot of cargo. It's still a manual, and I bet that light delivery would like an automatic transmission, but that's an expensive thing to develop, and I don't really want to do that right now. Well, I think we're looking solid enough to add this to our lineup of cars. And there's probably even room for another trim in our medium factory, but I might make that wait till next episode. And right now we're looking at 14 months with this together. We want to get these sliders up, though. We want tooling. We want reliability. Absolutely want process. This should help keep the price of our cars down. Ugh, 34 months is kind of longer than I wanted. Aerodynamics is a big factor for us. I may have to take that tray out. 
All right, how much did that save us? Wow. Yeah, we saved like six months by just not doing the tray. So the undercladding, it's gonna have to go. 28 months, I think I can work with that. Uh, yeah, hopefully we're not bankrupt by then. We're definitely not expanding the size of the factory. Already having trouble selling enough cars. We're at max two shifts. Uh, we cut some wages. Yeah, we can cut some wages. Sorry, guys. We got these things out the door for cheap, though. And $56 million estimated to repair the minor tooling. I don't think I've talked about this much. So you have your, your factory building condition and your major tooling, which is like the assembly line itself. And then minor tooling has to get rebuilt with a new trim or new facelift. And $56 million. So this we're reconfiguring some of those steel presses. That's very, very expensive. That's like... That dwarfs the engineering cost right there. So yeah, steel presses are rough. Uh, I used to always say you want to get those absolutely as early on as possible. Because monocoque makes your car way better. And uh, the steel's way cheaper. But... I think there's a bit more of a balance now where I would have been smarter to stay with aluminum like I was doing. And it does look like the... I can't call this the Mare D clone. What should I call our delivery car? I looked up the Italian word for box and it was Scatola. Which sounds excellent. The Coniglio Scatola is our delivery van. And let's see. Forecast is telling me I should be trending upwards in prices still. And that's what I will do, because although the goal of this company was to sell cheap cars that anyone can afford, uh, we won't be able to do that if we go bankrupt. So there we are, selling cars like 100% margin. Although that kind of belies the hidden cost of the tooling refresh that will come later. And I'm not going to sign off on this just yet because I have another project to add as well. Since we didn't get a lot of input from our board of directors on what the new model should be, I've gone ahead and done some off-camera research. I actually built a couple cars out and uh, decided what I want to do. I want to make a light sports car. That kind of fits with our city car theme. We're making small cars. It can share our small engine that we're already making. And I actually tried ahead some builds on a couple of bodies. And this is the body that's only mid-engine. Even looks like something that Alfa Romeo made. But uh, it didn't perform quite as well as our other option. This little coupe. With a 2.4 meter wheelbase. But uh, it has a rear engine option. And that's what we're going to build. So we've been building cars in our small factory out of aluminum, but also recently unlocked is fiberglass. This is actually more expensive than aluminum, and I think it's even less safe, but it is lighter in weight. And for our sports car, lightweight is everything. And it will be a space frame which is the lightest variety we can get in our small factory because unibody is not available to us. And it will be rear-engined. With double wishbones all around, as is our tradition, we could save a lot of money with McPherson struts, and that might be what I might do for a city car. But uh, for a sports car, I think you really need that double wishbone nice feeling handling and we're going to make a sport version of our Lenita engine so let's see when we last left off on our Lenita update we had negative quality and that's that's not going to do our sport version is not going to save those man hours on the pistons 
In fact, we need to go heavier so we can raise this dotted line here and make more power before the engine starts to risk premature failure. And in fact, I do think it's going to need that dampener too, so we can raise our, our crankshaft. It goes from 5,300 maximum RPM to 6,000. And these are all soft maximums. We can exceed them, it just hurts the reliability. So camshaft go up, springs go up, and what else go up, huh? Let's see. So everything's a little choked, it's yellow. That's often good for fuel economy tuning, but it's not what we want to do today. Uh, We're going to go to mid uh, everything. Which, uh, in this case, for the boxer, there's no different art asset. You can pretend that these little cast iron pipes are longer and have a, a they resonate better at higher RPMs. And so with the intake, we're going to go to a standard mid intake. Now we're making some more power. And you can see that the it's not falling off as early. We can increase our RPM limit and make even more power. Oh wow, when when do we start falling off? That's where we start falling off. Now at this point, we are stressing out our con rods because they are turning fast. And the only thing I can do to help with that is add even more quality. I put another man hour into this engine, to make the bottom end solid. And we are also choked now at the carburetor. And that is, yes, that is going to remain the case even if I go to maximum 100 carb size. So we need to change away from the eco type or add a second carburetor. And I like doing the dual carb because it means we don't have to engineer a new type of carburetor, only add a second one of the same kind to the engine. That's not like what you'd normally think of for a sports engine, but we can just make it a dual carb with the same carburetor we're already manufacturing, and that should be cheaper for us. If I shrink it down a little bit, we get some fuel economy back. 72 horsepower we're at now. If I were to go to, say, a four barrel carb, single, of course, uh, it actually. Yeah, it, even though we're getting rid of the Eco Carb, it's not really better. Well, actually, funny enough, it's cheaper to build. We have, uh, it saves a couple of man hours and some material cost, a lot of material costs going to the four barrel. But I think the engineering might be too much. So I am going to try the single barrel twin carb. And uh, I think oh, I can get a little more power out of the cams. I compress. We don't want even less compression, in fact. So the fuel economy of this engine is uh, not great at 8% thermal efficiency. It's like half what we got for our economy engine. But uh, a little louder, too. I think that muffler, the first one, just out. And uh, what, what, what's this sound like now? Very poppy. I dig it. So there, almost 75 horsepower. That's our sport motor. Absolutely must be a manual. Four speeds. Sticking to open diff. I don't think we have enough power to justify anything fancy here. And these are expensive, the clutch diffs. We can go with some sports tires. And make them reasonably wide. If we can go to 15-inch wheels and 60-profile tires, that'll be... Uh, 
relatively low profile for the time. Uh, definitely implementing those solid disc brakes, which uh, actually reminds me, I think I still did not put those in the Coniglio 2 all versions. So I might go back and do that. Maybe I'll put the cladding on this car. Then I can have it, you know, some familiarity when I add it to the Coniglio later. That's the cool thing about having a sports car as an economy car company is you can engineer it quick and get familiarity in new tech that's experimental and put it in your regular car later. Two plus two seating for sure. Premium, just like our beloved Coniglio. Get some quality points in there as well. Should be cheap to uh, engineer because it's like the same stuff. Manual power steering, good safety, standard springs. Uh, definitely got some goofiness to tune out. First things first, I'm going to remove a lot of body roll by getting these suckers out into the wheel well proper. That looks way better. And in fact, before I fine tune everything, because there's some morphs involved, why don't I go ahead and take a look at the fixtures I made? Because I did go ahead and design some fixtures in the, uh, not in the campaign, but in the car designer mode for this car. All right. I just need to pick out some wheels as well, but uh, feast your eyes on the all-new Caprice. I don't know if I probably should name our sports car after a salad, but uh, that's the next name we had, and this is the next car we had. I took a few design cues from a Skoda 110, which is another rear-engined, slightly sporty car, not as sporty as ours. But uh, another rear engine car. You can see that the ventilation is in back here. We got our lovely Corotta badge. And up front, there's no grill. But there's sort of a plastic fixture that looks like a grill that holds the license plate. Uh, we got some random aluminum bits for styling. Little feature I like. We have. Uh, put some carrot leaves on our handle here. The whole car is a darker shade of orange that I thought was still carroty. It's like the orange for our mainline cars, but it seems a little more sports car-y as well. The the bright orange is a little too, like, fun, not serious, if that makes any sense. Up in the dash here, we've got... Uh, I used an entire dashboard for this thing. I just, like made the rest of it invisible because uh, I wanted the top part to fit in really well. And then we got some of this nasty 70s plastic for the rest of our dash, which uh, I thought seemed appropriate. It'll be in at least the late 60s by the time this car actually comes out. I wanted this round, sporty dash. I think it's fun. So there it is, our first proper sports car. Only it's not quite ready yet. I'll need to still do some fine tuning. Uh, what wheels though? Well, give me a minute. Let me think here. We're still on steel wheels, so uh, some of the designs that probably look like aluminum, I won't be using. It's kind of limited to classic type still. Got some hubcap wheels. A little funny. They're uh, they're so deep dish because of the offset. There, something kind of reminiscent of our wheels on the other vehicles. They have a, a painted center cap that comes off. All right. So the engine is pretty much done. We have gearing, wheels, brakes, and suspension to figure out. 
And right away, we can see a major problem. This thing oversteers way too much. So I'm going to put some much narrower front tires on it. We're increasing camber all the way around. You can see the tire service cost multiplier shooting up as I cause tire wear with my irresponsible stance. See the, the tilt in the tire there. It's not exactly stance life, but it's it's starting. The earliest seeds of stance life have been planted in Kuroda in 1963. Just one tick of toe in, and we are under control. Comfort is very so-so, but sportiness is nice and high. Uh, apparently, the average light sport uh, competitor has a 12 in sportiness, which is pretty awful. We're sitting at 27. Meanwhile, I guess the average competitor, and we can look at these too, uh, in the sales breakdown, who is selling in light sport right now? I don't need to look at the averages. I can just see. Let's look in Ferinia only as well. So sport small, all, all Fruidian cars are what's selling in light sport. And uh, I guess our estimated sales of the Caprice would be very good. But sport small for Fruinia has their track premium car with, uh, wow, that's actually, that gives up a lot of comfort. And it's got a very, very high sportiness. Our car is pretty compromising compared to that. And not only that, but their drivability is better. I guess they've got stiffer suspension by a lot. You can see how low that thing looks like it's sitting. They have a, a light sport premium, a track trim, which gives up the drivability for even more sportiness. That's going to be a rock hard ride. And the next up competitor is this sleek looking thing, which is again, more sporty, less comfortable. And uh, I guess a little closer to us is there's a GT car that I guess is cheap enough to sell light sport because GT is like a very expensive market for the, the biggest and best sports cars that are also comfortable to travel in. And light sport is for like little sports cars for short trips and having fun on windy roads or the track. Now, I was trying to... Uh, Get this line just perfect. If you haven't, uh, if you're not familiar with this graph here, it's uh, yaw rate versus steering angle. And this axis is speed. So what it means is that at a given speed, if I input a steering angle of say three degrees, will the car turn more or less than three degrees in actuality? If our little yellow line is in between the red and blue, then the answer is basically yes. The, the car will steer the same amount as my steering input. If it's up in the red zone, then when I steer, the car is going to actually tend to rotate more than my steering. And that means that the back is starting to slide around on you. And if it's in the blue, then the car is not rotating when I steer as much as my steering would indicate. And that means you're understeering or plowing, sliding forward. So what I want is for this little sportiness dot to be right on the red edge. That means you have some very controllable oversteer that you can easily use to your advantage. Uh, and because of the weight distribution in this car, I can't get that little dot right up on the red line like I want to without this happening. Uh, that is called terminal oversteer, which is to say that the car will go into a complete spin. What you want is like this gentle into oversteer, but if you go too much, then it will just slide forward. Uh, so if it does this, it means your car is dangerous, basically. And uh, I don't want to sell a car that's too dangerous. Anyway, following the, the lead of the market, I'm going to still stiffen up the suspension another tick. I can lose a couple points of comfort and gain a few points of sportiness. I think that'll be the right direction for us. And drivability goes up as well. So this these bars 
uh, this line is perfect drivability, uh, as comfortable, like it's as easy to drive as possible in the suspension. It's very responsive. Down here is most comfortable, and way up here is most sportiness. So at a certain point, as the springs get stiffer, you lose drivability and gain sportiness. And we saw that some of those track car trims were in there. But I don't like to go that high. I like to leave some comfort in. I think it lets the car settle more markets. It's something you actually want to drive on the road, right? Uh, brakes. We're doing pretty good. The car doesn't weigh anything, so it's easy to stop. There's some other stats as well. We want throttle response. Doing good there already. We want agility. I don't understand what that means. And we want cornering, which is the cornering G's here for a low speed steering. There's a low speed graph and there's a high speed graph, which is the aerodynamics. Uh, we care about low speed for light sport. We're not going like 100 miles an hour around a corner. Uh, well, I can see I'm getting a bonus from agility, but I still don't know what that means. One of the many mysteries of automation. If I went and actually seriously made a list of everything I don't completely understand, I could probably be here all day. Oh, by the way, if you've been looking for it, here's the new emissions chart, which, uh, it's coming up on us. Well, not yet. This graph is blank because in the 60s, no one has emissions requirements. So anyway, Light Sport does like our cornering G to be as high as possible. And at 1.02 Gs, we're doing very good for 1963. I could try and go higher. I make the rear tires wider, front tires wider, bring it back under control. Man, it is hard to bring it back under control. Oh, -ho. almost 1.1 Gs. That's some serious turning we're doing. I like that. So you can see that uh, the cornering Gs respond pretty quickly to small changes. So getting the absolute most cornering out of your car requires uh, fine tuning, let's say. I also want to see if I can bring my weight a little towards the front. Will that help us any? The answer is I'm going to say no. I guess I'm happy with that tune. Now, gearing, instead of having an overdrive gear, I'm going to see how it handles with the last gear being the top speed. And get the first gear nice and low so we can accelerate quickly. Now, for some reason, I, it won't let me put the first and last gear very far apart. You'd think I could have a first gear at 22 miles an hour and a fourth gear at 103 miles an hour it wouldn't be that big of an issue but it's already reducing my max speed unless i go into advanced mode and i'm told this can hurt your reliability but we will see if it actually does it doesn't appear to be doing so right now so i just keep making that gear shorter and shorter until the green numbers stop going up which might happen never. So I mean, I could have a first gear that caps it at 16 miles an hour. So you are just using that gear to launch. Second gear at 36. Gotta be careful where I put third gear. because That affects my 0 to 60 time. 12.8 seconds is, uh, I guess, not bad. We have some rather short gearing, some rather poor fuel economy because of it. We get 19 miles per gallon in a 1.6 liter in a car that doesn't weigh anything. But we gained a lot of sportiness and a lot of drivability. So the car is more comfortable to drive in uh, because it accelerates more easily. And it feels faster. Definitely want that. Now I think we've uh, got a car that's seriously set up for some sports car market action. 
I would say racing, but we can't really race in the game yet. Although you could definitely set one of these up for racing. I have to do a lap in BeamNG, in fact. While I'm at it, I might just consider making a convertible. That seems to have translated without too much problems. It's a lot to engineer. We'll have an automatic soft top in this. And uh, let's see, my sportiness has been destroyed. Because I guess the... Ooh, yeah, we added a lot of weight to the rear there. Yeah, there's a convertible sport market, but they're not quite doing it. Their affordability is 81% and desirability is 35%. Just to say, this car is just too cheapy for most people who want a convertible sports car. And I don't think the budget market has a lot of money in it. So I'm not sure that uh, I might just put the convertible on hold for now, save some engineering time. And let's see, we're defaulting to 48 months. Definitely want it out sooner. The, uh, the Coniglio facelift is coming out in just 28 months. I don't even get this as far down as that. Oh wow, process has a big effect on the price of these cars because that fiberglass costs a lot. So process affects our material costs. And if we turn it up, we waste less raw materials, but we use more man hours to make the cars. And I think it's probably worth it to optimize a little bit in that regard. Only we don't have a lot of engineering time. Uh, there, at this rate, the car will come out five months after. Also tune our engine project to get done in 28 months, which means we have some juicy tooling and reliability gain. Better chill out my worker quality requirements a bit because we are having trouble hiring as we saw. And for the price of all this other crap, upgrading the factory with some good quality tools is not that much to us. And of course, it's going in the factory. The little factory that started our company. This used to be a tiny factory. Now it's a small three. But because of the uh, crowded property around it, it can grow no bigger. And because this project was rushed and uses some fiberglass and stuff that is kind of handmade, 90 automation is no longer going to be optimal. 40 should do max tooling quality. Very low construction cost. We're in fact getting a refund. We have a negative minor tooling cost because I'm decreasing automation so much and selling off my machines. I just set to average budget for a light sport buyer in Fruinia. We are predicted to make some money. Uh, it estimates we will have very low factory shifts of one and a required of 0.5. I'm hoping that's just because we haven't entered the sports car market before. Once I do some marketing, hopefully we will uh, be able to sell these things. There, I am going to sign off on the Coniglio, get that out a few months before the Caprice. I will take the loan. We might be getting the company deep into all kinds of loans, but I just need to take the loan. So right now we're losing all kinds of money as we are building our new engine factory. Hopefully we'll see our profits turn around once we uh, get that done, though. God dang, Coniglio Prears are going up. You know what? Screw you guys. It's going to cost you 
all kinds of freaking money if you want an original Coniglio. They're now limited edition. They're collectible. Ooh, and as of now, we have both engine factories running. I'm going to increase these to 2.5 shifts max. And there, now we have some more car production happening. We started to make a little stock of the Coniglio 2. We even had a couple of profitable months there. Looks like our company might not go bankrupt after all. Now, I need to plan this right. Because I made this project for the Coniglio 2B, and the Engine Factory 3 was not a part of it, I will need to manually change Engine Factory 3 over to the new project. Otherwise, it will still be making the older version of the engine, which isn't used by our cars. And I'm not sure how long that's going to take. If I just leave everything as is and change it over, uh, build time of one month, apparently. That's not so bad. So I will wait uh, to pay attention uh, and right when everything else is shutting down for retooling, I will start doing that to Engine Factory 3. Unfortunately, I really wish I could, like, put a pin on the timeline and then have it do it when I said so. But instead, I have to press play, pay attention, and, and don't screw up. Okay, so uh, let's see. Our revenue is not mostly coming from the loan. And uh, we're making a profit. So it looks like all this time we were losing money, the main problem was that the engine factory was choking our whole production. And once we got that figured out, we're doing okay. Man, wow. The Scatola is 200% desirable in light delivery. Now, me playing on insane mode, where the AI competitor cars get a 30% bonus, that's insane. What does the light delivery market look right now? It looks like uh, the leader is very similar. It says the model is called Commuter. And it has a light delivery trim. So it's much like us, where we made a little city car and then also a van version of it. it wasn't made to be a delivery vehicle at first. And Industry 3 has an actual van that is the second best selling, not the first. Including this thing, which is like, man, what the heck is that? I can't picture that driving around in 1964, a delivery van that's based on this, like, luxury car body. There's even Arcana cars. Uh, do I turn off Arcana? Yeah, they're still, they, they're getting exported. It's kind of your, uh, Polsky Fiat sort of thing, only they've got a, a van version of it. Oh yeah, marketing. Now that we are no longer in the red, I really should be spending money on marketing like a lot. So I've added a lot of sportiness, some prestige, plus one in most of our main categories. Fuel economy for sure. And the special category of cornering which is perfect for our light sport target markets. Oh yeah, I gotta do utility as well. We gotta sell those vans. I can't believe people are like, it's not gonna come out for six months and they're pre-ordering delivery vans. I thought if you needed a delivery van, you probably needed it right away. Uh, R&D as well. They're yeah, spending about little shy of a million dollars. I want some 
top end on the engines for sure. A lot in the engine development. And some of the drivetrain. It's, it's expensive, but I also want aerodynamics. That'll help us get some fuel economy. It's expensive to actually put aero quality points on. Oof, that took a chunk out. I might be spending a little much on... Uh, research isn't crazy, a little lot on marketing. Just had 10 million extra dollars in factory refresh costs. Oh, and that's a good reminder that Engine Factory 3, now I must change it over to the new engine. How much time would it take one to upgrade it? Five months? Uh, ooh, maybe better not right now. Ooh, zero months to hire. Running it. I can cut wages and demand more of my workers. Sorry. I'm a terrible boss. We don't want to make cars that everybody can afford, but uh, we don't want to help our workers afford them. So we started off in 1963 is now 1965. Uh, we are getting some warnings because there's five months where the Coniglio 1 wants its factory. Actually, I really could have waited until the end of 1965 and kept making those Coniglio 1s. But uh, that's fine. It looks like the Coniglio 2 is selling nicely. Oh no, a quality issue. Your staff discovered a small issue. The production of Coniglio 2. Let's do the uh, the classic, the quiet recall. That is to say, we are not issuing a recall notice. We are just fixing cars whenever they come in. I think Mercedes is kind of famous for doing that. So there's a low chance it will get discovered, in which case we'll take a little bit of a reputation hit. But if we do, it won't be that much. If we did nothing at all, it'd be much worse. And uh, I do want to run a couple months. Lots of money is coming in now. So the Caprice is selling nicely. It uh, apparently has poor desirability, but it is selling. The Coniglio is selling nicely. We're just starting to catch up on pre-orders for the Primo, but the Merida and Scatola are still pre-ordered. So overall, we came out of our factory crisis and our, our labor crisis, and we're making lots of money since that's solved and car production is now flowing smoothly. We're paying off our loan no problem. Our profits are greater than our loan payments. The... Uh, the company started to build up a little bit of prestige, not much, and a lot of reputation. And uh, I don't know if I explain these, how this works is the prestige stat on your cars, if it's higher than average when you sell a car, uh, I think of all cars sold in your country, it might be, not based on what market they are, then you gain some prestige. And of course, we're selling some cheap cars, so it's not going to be very high, but it's not negative either. So that can add to the desirability of our cars. And a reputation, that's based on reliability, and we're doing pretty good. It looks like our rival, Dunbar 3, is climbing up in the ranks of luxury sellers. They have come out with the Model 2. I guess I missed exactly when it came out, because they're already on Mark 2. And a lot more modern. Again, we're not really directly competing with them because they're in like the luxury segment and we are in premium at best and mostly like budget. Uh, if I look at our main sales, city is our biggest demographic by far. Light delivery is actually catching up to that. It's like our second biggest. 
the van selling like hotcakes. They always do an automation. And our light sport market's taking off pretty good as well. That's pretty just a caprice. In fact, I guess it must be a pretty fun car to drive because it's getting sales up in sports cars, which is people who have money for a much nicer kind of car, but they're buying our cheap 1.6 liter rear engine sports car instead. Some people are choosing it when they're shopping for a supercar. They went out, they tried out the Ferrari dealerships. You know, those are posh ass dealerships. Everybody's got nice suits. They're giving you free snacks. And uh, you're, you're test driving your, man, what is it in 1966? I guess a Ferrari 330 is what the internet tells me with a four liter V12. Uh, some people went, they tried those and they said, you know what? I, uh, on a lark, went to that cheap ass Corota dealership. They still have a display in the department store with a car in it. And, uh, I test drove one of those Caprices, their silly sports car they named after a salad. And that thing was great, actually. That's why I want to buy instead. Same deal for GT and GTP. We have a couple odd sales in, uh, people who are looking at Jaguars and Mercedes but uh, they decided they just go for our cheaper car instead I might have to make a luxury trim or something I don't know now if we look in city we are still pretty far down on a list of top sellers family small three Ferunia remains on top their city premium car has a 56 drivability 21 comfort and 62% affordability. Ours has 53.9 drivability, 23 comfort. So we're, we're pretty close on those scores. But it's more expensive. It's 19% affordability. So if we want to become number one in the city market, it's clear we have to stay true to our original goal, which is make these cars cheaper. Well, before we end the episode, of course, we've got to do some BMNG driving in our new car. And I know what you guys want to see. That's right, the Scatola delivery van. We're going to see how the newest generation of the Camellio 2 performs while hauling around a giant box body makes the back suspension sag down. And uh, the answer to that question, in case you're wondering, is not great. And the gearing is still very wide. Oh, yeah, that's rough. Gotta use the handbrake to get it to corner quick, it feels like. Come on. First gear, second gear. Get that speedometer up. Here's a big turn. Oh. Nope. Unfortunately, all of the pizzas have been damaged. Well, you heard it here first, folks. The delivery van, not that great for sporty driving. Now, of course, we really want to test out the Scatola, our new sports car. I'm uh, pretty happy with this shade of orange we picked. Some stuff didn't make the transfer to BMG perfectly. I had that color-changing iridescent paint on the carrot. Yeah, it's just purple now. Uh, the carrot looks like even more crap in BMG than it did in automation. Text doesn't go over the BMG that well either. But I still think I've made a uh, not too ugly looking car here.
So it's a three shift journey, 60 miles an hour. But on the bright side, you actually get to accelerate in second gear. Ooh, gonna take some learning from me, but uh, that rear engine definitely gets you spinning around the corners if that's what you want. Synchronizer damage. Shut up, BMG. I know how to drive a car. It's always okay to bounce it off the limiter. There we go. I actually feel like this car would probably gone with uh, wider front tires. A little too understeery. I know automation warned about that terminal oversteer, but. So there, I think that's uh, some evidence that 75 horsepower is enough to have some fun. But let's take it to the test track as well. All right, automation test track. We'll skip through most of this. As you can see, I did say 75 horsepower is enough to have fun, but it's a bit of a lazy accelerator. It's like full throttle through that outside bend. And... I'm not getting the uh, car designer 1.09G either through there. Going downhill and forth, it looks like the, uh, I think we're gonna crack 100 miles an hour. Ooh, oh, it's struggling. Yes, just 100 exactly in a slingshot. That's what I'm gonna be aiming for in BMG. Brakes and. Ooh, above 60, 65 through, is that Killer Rob's Corner? I forget the names are not labeled. And coming across the finish line with a final time of 2.49. Not that fast for a sports car. We'll see uh, how fast my lap is. I like the short race track circuit for a car like this. I wonder if we're going to get that as a thing you can do in the automation tester soon. Hey, I like how that feels. I'm, uh, I'm not taking a good racing line. I'm kind of playing with the car, but... Uh, wants to rotate, but then it's easy to get the stop. Full throttle, just like in the simulations. Next corner is 65. Okay, yeah, I probably could have taken that faster. I keep 
try a downshift, not be able to, because the uh, gears are so short. I want more power, but I can't get it. That's going in the grass. A little too brave of me. I remember I'm still on 1960s tires. several seconds slower, and I guess that lap's not surprising. Just about 10 seconds slower than the automation stick for my first run. But, uh, I'm happy with the car. It was fun. Coming up in the next episode, we've got $150 million, and we need to figure out what to do with it. We could probably expand our factory for the Coniglio 2, and in that case, we might be able to put a new trim on the Coniglio as well. Maybe a premium or convertible trim. The Caprice is only making one trim. I'm not sure if we want to try to make like an upmarket GT trim for that or something. Uh, we don't have a ton of body options, just a convertible, which the markets didn't seem to like. I could give another crack at it. Or we could even try and go for another model. I might wait a couple years before doing that so we have lots of money. But, I'll give you a look at the car bodies we have right now. We currently have a compact sports car and a compact city car. We could have our eyes on maybe a mid-size car if we wanted to. That could be our premium model. I guess we haven't got a lot of good bodies unlocked recently. And coming up, we have... There's a neat sports car, but I think that's mid-engined. Vans. There's always vans. Oh man, in 1970, we get a 1.9 meter wheelbase van. If we wanted a, a dedicated utility vehicle, that could be an option. It's a little goofy, though. What else in 1970? Not seeing any really small, there's a 2.3 meter. That's like almost mid-size for us because we like our tiny cars. But uh, there's some other small car options. So yeah, not sure what's next, but uh, leave your suggestions in the comments. Oh, and last but not least, we're still seeking some more competitor companies to compete against Crota Motors, just like you've seen Dunbar 3 in the market screen. If you've got a save file on the Ellisbury update and you want to compete, send it to me. And we will have your cars trying to take Corotta down a peg. That's all for now. See you guys in the next episode.